What's up, Wizards? It's Dev, SBMTG. We're looking at magic, all the things that you know by now, and today we're trying something just a little bit different. You might be able to tell straight from the offset here, testing out this screen recording software. Everybody says i got to do gameplay, or my channel's dead or something. It's usually how the argument goes, so I'm going to start trying to do some gameplay. Uh, but first got to test out this screen recording software, so we'll see how that works. Uh, but I'm going to do that by going over the quote-unquote best, uh, really, let's just say subjectively, my favorite decks. <laughs> From week zero of standard play, uh, you know, the set just came out in paper, but it's been available online on both Arena and MTGO for about a week now, and we've gotten a couple of rounds of competitive league results, and right now, SCG Richmond, it's an open, um, it's finishing up as I record this, so there's going to be more decks to look at before the weekend's out, but I wanted to go ahead and check out some of the coolest like, you know, tech or weird Johnny stuff <laughs> that we saw in the first week of standard play. Starting with this deck that you're looking at right here, which is White Black Knights finally being a real deck. This actually isn't the first time that White Black Knights has returned, like, week zero, week one, week two results, and then it's kind of dropped out of the format, but it's kind of interesting to look at how the deck is built now, you know? We've still got Knight of Grace, as usual, um, as well as Knight of Malice, of course, but Midnight Reaper, is also a, a knight, so that's pretty sweet right there. The deck also kind of randomly plays Seraph of the Scales, so it can uh, fill out its four drop slot. I think there's probably other ways of doing that. I do like Seraph of the Scales, though. It gives the deck a flying creature. It's really important. Also, some sweeper protection. There's some good stuff about Seraph of the Scales, obviously, but there's also... Uh, Gideon and Liliana in this deck. I think Gideon is just an obvious add to any like white mid-range deck. And the thing is, sometimes you'll see like a really aggressive, low to the ground version of this white black knights deck that plays, you know, like a Johnny at the top of its curve to get knights back and stuff like that. But this time we're seeing this deck go a little bit farther up the curve, playing more three drops than usual. Again, obviously Gideon is just unbelievable in pretty much any white mid-range deck he's an auto include but Liliana is the more interesting inclusion to me because she costs six mana um <laughs> you know what I was saying a second ago about how the, these knights decks will sometimes try to go underneath go low to the ground this is the exact opposite you know it turns out what this what this deck is actually trying to do it, it appears to me is take advantage of Liliana by dropping a bunch of like small, hard-to-deal-with creatures that are kind of must-answers. You know, I imagine going Seraph of the Scales on four and a couple of turns later getting Liliana is really good, and obviously sacking Seraph of the Scales or the Afterlife tokens to Liliana seems pretty good, too. That's a lot of card draw right there. So, a lot of decks have been playing Liliana you know, at the very top of the curve, but they're doing it in, like, Soltai or Golgari, where they can drop Wild Growth Walker, explore it a couple of turns, like Jade Light Ranger and Merfolk Branch Walker, and uh, try to go above aggro in that way, you know, present a speed bump so they can get farther on into the game, and then drop a Liliana once it's nice and protected with big Wild Growth Walkers and stuff. So that's one way to go, um, and that sounds like the right strategy, but this deck is doing a similar thing where it's just dropping early creatures like this, you know? Um, presenting uh, the things that have to be answered, and when the opponent is exhausted on resources, that's when you can drop a Liliana. Either that, or you can drop a Liliana when you're ahead and you already have a bunch of creatures on board, and she's just amazing in that situation, too. So, I really like uh, what this deck is trying to do, especially compared to the, the usual Black White Knights fair. You know, it's got even more mid-range stuff in there. I mean, there's main deck duress. You don't see that every day, but there's an awful lot of control strategies. And just like this blue blight mid-range thing that's going around, plus Nexus, if you're on MTGO or in paper. So... I think Duress in the main deck is actually great. The other week on Twitter, I actually said, like, just here to advocate for Duress in the main deck, and uh, here, here we have it. <laughs> it makes perfect sense, but this deck actually has a lot of, like, two of answers, you know, two Liliana, uh, two Seraph, two Duress, two Cast Down, two Mortify, two Vraskas, two Eldest Reborn, and you see, I want to <laughs> hit on that in a second, but, um... A lot of two ofs, and you'll see that a lot in um, decks at the beginning of season. Uh, you know, it's not quite refined or tuned yet, hasn't had enough games to really decide what needs to be in the sideboard, what needs to be cut, and all that. So, But I will say that a two of Eldest Reborn looks really, really good right now, especially if you're just going mid range anyway. You know, going mid range is kind of freeing for this deck because it doesn't have to worry about, like, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's curve, it's two drops, it's three drops, aren't really the end all be all. And those are actually pretty easy to fill out anyway. You just play the Knights in the two-drop slot, plus a Dante Vanguard, that's pretty easy to include, too. And you got History of Benalia and Gideon at the three-drop slot, which is pretty set in stone, you know? So, really, your two and three-drops aren't that much of your, your worry now. It's like, do I go lower or do I go, you know, higher? 
And I think that the idea of going higher with like Liliana and Eldritch Reborn is actually a really, really good idea, especially considering how good Eldritch Reborn is in a format like full of Planeswalkers. Plus, beside that, just the you know usual removal package for a black-white mid-range deck. I'm a little surprised this doesn't play Oath of Kaya, although another version of the deck does. There's another version of this deck that's not so heavy on the night theme. It does play Grace and Malice, but it doesn't play Midnight Reaper. Um, and even though these aren't knights, I don't think it plays Adanto Vanguard or Seraph of the Scales. Like the only other creature that it plays is a Johnny's Pride Mate. Amazingly, but you know, it plays Moment of Craving, Grass's Contempt, those gain life. But it also plays Soren in that deck, and that obviously lets your creatures have lifelink. Um, and it gets back your knights and stuff. It plays a Johnny for the same reason, get back your knights. So it's kind of a super frenzy thing that uh, gets to play Oath of Kaya because it has so many planeswalkers. So that would be a good card in here. And another version of the deck has already um, sort of slotted it in just because it plays more walkers. But there's a fine removal suite here, you know. A couple of cast downs for two drop removal, a couple of mortify for three drop removal that also takes out like Wilderness Reclamation and Search for Kanta and all kinds of stuff. Experimental Frenzy. We're seeing more of that card here in the format um, in sort of big red lists. And then Brass's Contempt is Catch-All Removal, also good in a format full of Planeswalkers. So it's just kind of a basic white blight mid-range deck that probably gets an awful lot of mileage out of Liliana. And I really like these two together. It's not like they curve um, or anything, but if you go Gideon on three and your opponent just like, you know, has to deal with that and they actually use a removal spell on it or, you know, they contrive a way to get rid of it. And then just like a turn later, you draw Liliana. So it's like from the frying pan into the fire, you know, so. I, I do like a lot of what this deck is doing. It fills out its early curve with aggression, and just when you think it's safe, it drops a Liliana or whatever. So that <laughs> seems like a cool deck. Um, I'm not really sure what I would change about it. I'm not going to go too deep on like theory crafting uh, how these decks need to tune. Although this does probably need um, a better card advantage piece. Like Liliana is a great card advantage piece. It's all the way up here at um, six. <laughs> I like a way to sort of bridge the gap, especially in a deck that's going a little bit slower. But, you know, it needs all these aggressive pieces, too, so I get why it's doing that. Okay, so next up, let's look at Gruul Midrange. And it's not like this is, like, a, a cool or unique build right now or anything. You know, Gruul Midrange has been a deck of relative force in Standard for a few months now, ever since RNA came out. Um, but this is a much different build of the deck than we've been seeing over the last couple of months. You know, we've got um, a package of creatures that is fairly standard. You know, Chain Whirler is in here. Just pretty much all the strongest Gruul creatures. you got Chain Whirler, Grow Chamber Guardian in the two-drop slot. You'll also see Direfleet Daredevil occasionally in this two-drop slot, just to point that out. And you got Gruul Spellbreaker in the three-drop slot, too. It makes perfect sense, you know, between <laughs> Spellbreaker and Goblin Chain Whirler, you just got this ridiculous suite of three. Um, but Lano Rails is there to ramp a little bit. You won't always see this in every version of the deck. This is actually the creature that gets swapped out for Direfleet Daredevil, really. But there's also Rekindling Phoenix, because obviously Rekindling Phoenix. If you're going to build a green-red mid-range deck, this is kind of, in some ways, the, the card that the deck is built around. Um, just because, again, just like the Black White Knights deck and a lot of mid-range decks that we'll see in this format, it's like they're kind of low to the ground, but they're also still mid-range, you know? They present all these early threats that must be dealt with. Growth Chamber, Spellbreaker, Chain Whirler, you know, these just, like, massive, splashy cards that have this huge effect on the game when you play them and you got to do something about them or they just spiral out of control. Like, crab people <laughs> can get way out of control way too fast. Um, so you got to do something about these, and then you drop a Kindling Phoenix, and it's like, ah, oh, crap, I already used Vrassus Content. <laughs> you know, I already used the Conclave Tribunal, so what do I do? Um, but this deck does give itself some interesting card advantage and some really cool late-game options. You, know, you see Chandra, Fire Artisan, three of them in this deck, but a four of them in some other Gruul builds this season so far. Um, and this actually goes with Experimental Frenzy in like these big red decks. We see four copies of Chandra and four copies of Frenzy, which surprised me. You have a card on top of your library that you can't cast right then and there. Well, just like exile it with Chandra and keep going. You know, you don't even care if you cast the card you exiled. You're just trying to get past the top card of your library to make Experimental Frenzy keep working. So we see it in that capacity, but we also see it in these mid-range decks. It's just a card advantage tool. And if your opponent does want to attack into it, they have to take some damage. You know, it's my favorite thing about Chandra. And I brought this up before, but it's like a card advantage piece. Uh, that doesn't, like, penalize you for taking the turn off to play it, you know. If they do want to attack into your Chandra, they're going to take damage. So, kind of, you're gaining life by, you know, diverting attention away from you. You know, your opponent attacks your Planeswalkers rather than you. So you're kind of gaining life, you're drawing cards, but you're also dealing damage to your opponent. So, again, it doesn't feel like you took a turn off to, like, play a non-relevant, at the time, uh, card advantage piece. So Chandra's really, really good. 
uh, in that capacity. But this is kind of a, a really planeswalker rich deck. You may notice you see four copies of Domery in the three drops, or in the yeah, the three drop slot that gives us twelve total three drops in the deck. A little bit above what you usually see in these decks, but it's totally fine. Domer just makes uh, most plays after him on the curve insane. You know, you can ramp into Sarkin with Domery. Uh, you don't care that Sarkin's not a creature, you know, the the can't-be-countered part of the text really doesn't matter in that case, but just ramping into a 5-drop like Sarkin is great, especially considering Darmy's a Planeswalker, Sarkin makes all your Planeswalkers into dragons for a turn, so, you know, starting on the next turn, if you untap with both of the walkers in play, you can start really just going to town with them, but also, creatures you control getting plus 1, plus 0, that means that not only, you know, when Sarkin's a dragon and when Domi's a dragon, they're going to get a little bo uh, boost, but you know, Goblin Chain Whirler, Rekindling Phoenix, Cruel Spellbreaker, these are already, like, above-rate creatures. Even Grotraper Guardian has the ability to be above-rate, and Domery's just going to make you that much more aggressive, going to give you a little bit of stretch against these counterspell decks, you know, control decks like Esper and such. We've even seen Jeskai pop up, um, Demir, still a control deck, although it's more of a mid-range deck than anything else now, so. Don't worry, just protect you against counters, it's really important in this format. And, it even gives you a form of removal, you know, we've got these big creatures, and especially with things like Rekindling Phoenix, we actually don't care if Phoenix dies in a fight exchange, because it's going to be right back, you know, you swing in with it, if it survives combat, you can Domri you know, something that didn't block or something that didn't die in combat or whatever. So a lot of cool stretch with that. Plus things like um, Gruul Spellbreaker are just big enough to survive most fight interactions. You know, um, Grow Chamber Guardian, you can always know that it's going to die in a fight interaction, but just like adapt it, you know, so that you get another Grow Chamber Guardian in your hand anyway, so you didn't really lose any card advantage. So there's a lot of cool stuff about Domri in this deck. It works with a lot of stuff, but Sarkin has really kind of been um, uh, the toast of these red decks. You know, both um, Big Red, just like Chandra plays, uh, sees playing Big Red, Sarkin does too. Um, and in these, like, sort of red-based Super Friends decks that we've seen a couple of, um, but they haven't been super successful so far. But Sarkin is at the top of the curve there, too, because this is just one of the best ways to win in a deck with a lot of Planeswalkers, you know. And if nothing else, it's going to be a 4-4 Dragon on the next turn. So, you know, it's never uh, completely valueless for what that's worth. But if you do have, you know, if you go, if you actually curve into, like, Domri, Chandra, Sarkin, then you can you have the potential to end the game right then and there. As far uh, as far as like removal goes, we see Lightning Strike and Shock, a very light removal package. And another Gruul deck that I've seen actually switches these. You know, two Shock, three Lightning Strike. And as the format kind of grows out of aggro, gets more mid-range, which it's looking like it's going to happen, but it's not a guarantee. You know, Mono White and Mono Red are still real decks. Even Mono Blue Tempo is obviously still a deck too. So carrying Shock is still important. We see a lot of decks with Lawn War Elves and stuff too. So Shock is still an important card in the format. But I feel like as things trend more mid-range, we'll see lightning strike to take out this certain creatures <laughs> you know well, too many to count but either way you go here you probably do need a five or six card removal package you can't just like oh, i'm gonna play the biggest thing every turn and they have to deal with it that's sometimes an important strategy right but you still need to be able to take out like key creatures in this format you have to interact Altogether, this looks like a really um, interesting build of Gruul, but I'm not sure that it's, you know, exactly right. A lot of people have talked um, about how Chandra and Sarkin are sort of standouts from Week Zero, but, you know, just because a card shows up in Week Zero... These are both cards that I like, by the way. Let me just point that out, but just because a card shows up in Week Zero doesn't mean that, you know, it's not going to get cut. You know, we're doing a lot of experimenting in the first week or two of the format, um, but we're really just trying to lab things. And so things may very well get cut down from here. Like, I'm not sure that four Domri is correct, even though I think Domri is a great Planeswalker. Um, four Sarkin, you know, four copies of a five-drop Planeswalker. I'm just not sure that's exactly where you want to be, especially with Chandra in the deck to draw cards. Sometimes you'll see a couple of copies of Karn in the deck to draw cards. Obviously, Big Red plays Experimental Frenzy, you know, and they play Sarkin, so I'm just not sure. That was so much, like, card draw. Sometimes you'll see Light Up the Stage in Chandra in the same deck. So, like, so much card draw, I'm just not sure that you need, you know, a play set of your five-drop Legendary Planeswalker. So, there's some kinks to work out. It appears on paper, you know, again, I haven't played this deck or anything, but there are definitely some pl some places you can fudge the numbers, you know, like sometimes you'll see the four of Darfleet Daredevil instead of Lana or else in the deck, and I think you might be able to do, you know, like a three of Sarkin, three of Domri, fit in two copies of Darfleet if that's what you're trying to do, but again, there's just a lot of play in the Gruul deck, and that's nothing but good news.
But on to the third deck I want to look at here. Let's check out Demir Invasion by Samuel Gravener. I'm not sure that I've said the other people's names, and I apologize for that. <laughs> Just right off the rip. I think uh, the White Black Knights deck was Gold Ducat, and the Gruel Midrange deck was uh, H. Shipley. But anyway, credit where it's due. This one by Sammy Graves. And this deck looks really, really cool to me. We've seen a lot of different takes on sort of Demir Midrange already in this format, and even though I'm not sure that this is, you know, the perfect list, uh, for a couple of reasons, this is definitely the most interesting list, I'd say, 100%, you know. Not only does it have the 4 of Invasion, uh, and I wasn't actually sure that this was, like, a main deck, standard card, I was pretty sure it was, you know, sideboard against control, but, and I still think that if aggro is an important force in the format, I'm not sure how good Invasion actually is, but with a mid-rangey and control-oriented format, Dreadhorde Invasion is obviously a main deck card, and it goes really, really well with stuff like um, Enter the God Eternals, which I'm a little surprised to only see a two of here, but if you go, you know, Invasion on two or three, and then eventually you get Enter the God Eternals, it's very likely that, you know, your army token is going to be a 6-6, six, six, so it gets this, you know, nice lifelink bonus and gains you back all the life that you've lost so far from it. Plus, you know, Enter the God Eternals gains you back some of that life that you lost from Invasion too. so there's a lot to like about the interaction between the two cards, but... ETG is ridiculous <laughs> just by itself. You know, if you get to the point against any aggro deck where you can cast this card, you can just turn the game around, play right then and there, you know, kill their Chain Whirler, their Spellbreaker, whatever, gain a bunch of life back, um, and get a giant guy of your own to start blocking for you. Or just, you know, turn the corner and swing in sometimes. You just have a win condition in and of itself. So just enter the God Eternals. Everyone knew that this was going to be a played standard card. We just weren't sure what kind of numbers it was going to show up in. And honestly, this two of is atypical. It's a bit of an outlier. We've seen three and four of for the most part um, into the God Eternal so far in this format. But again, as the format trends either you know, more control or more mid-rangey, I think less copies of ETG is probably the, the right call. But aside from that, there's some other you know interesting stuff in the deck. We see things like Thought Erasure, which are fairly typical for you know any blue-black archetype. But aside from that, things start like going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> really fast, you know. I guess there's Cast Down in here, Vraska's Contempt, I mean, all stuff that you're pretty used to seeing, just, you know, utility cards, but we do also see Tyrant Scorn. Um, I was hoping this would show up in the early days of the format, and it did. You know, even with a bunch of, you know, kind of go slightly bigger mid-range decks, uh, this is still fantastic. You know, even those mid-range decks, the ones that we've talked about so far today even, um, play a bunch of, like, small-ish creatures, you know, um, at the beginning of the curve. Tyrant Scorn is great against all of them, from, like, you know, Chain Whirler, Gruel Spellbreaker, on down, Tempest Gen, whatever. So, just a lot to like about Scorn. And uh, this also lets you, you know, repeat Enter the Battlefield triggers. Like, let's say you wanted Gleaming Overseer again, just for the sake of argument. You could get that, but mostly this is for popping big creatures back to their owner's hand, or just straight-up killing uh, 90% of the time, that's what you're going to use it for, just killing small creatures. But aside from that, the exciting stuff is, again, <laughs> sorry, cup just fell over for no reason. But <laughs> you see Liliana again. This showed up in so many decks uh, <laughs> over the weekend. This wasn't my top ten, but it probably should have been, like, in the top five or top three. You know, this really showed up a lot more than I initially gave it credit for. If the format is as mid-range as we want it to be, this is just going to be everywhere because it does everything. You know, again, whether you're ahead or you're behind when you play Liliana, it's going to do so much for you. Draw you a bunch of cards, kill a couple of creatures on the other side of the table, make creatures for you. You know, just plus one to make a creature is always a really good <laughs> Planeswalker ability. So, almost no matter what point of the game or what the board state looks like, what your life total is when you drop Liliana, like, she just does so much for you, so we're going to see a lot of this. This looks to be the next incarnation of Elspeth, you know, a six-mana walker that can actually get there in standard, and I think Liliana is, uh, you know, statted perfectly, you know. She, she comes down as effectively a seven-loyalty planeswalker most of the time, and that's just so much to deal with if they don't have, like, the Brass's Contempt right then and there. But aside from that, there's some weird stuff in here, you know, Gleaming Overseer. I'll, I'll point this card out again, but this is mostly to make your Dreadhorde Invasion token um, Hexproof and Menace, you know. Very often, especially after an Enter the God Eternals, you'll just have like a 7-7, seven, seven, you know, army token, and making it Hexproof is just like this huge headache. 
Plus, Gleaming Overseer gives you another body against control. That's always good to go wide a little bit. Um, but really, the, the best play this has, uh, in a lot of cases, against Aggro. I played this in the Grixis Zombies deck at the beginning of the season, and this is a great card to block against Aggro on the ground. You know, it blocks Goblin Chain Whirler, uncountered, uh, well, you know, Gruul Spellbreakers, they didn't put the counter on. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff all the way up the curve that this can block for you, and it's a really good toughness rate for only three mana. Um, but obviously, the abilities that it bestows are insane, too. I also see four copies of Soul Diviner in this deck, which is, like, really surprising to me that they went all all the way with four copies. Now, this can take um, counters off of a lot in this deck. You know, it can take counters off of a mass tokens, obviously, but also it takes counters off of Liliana, and it takes counters off of the treasure map that you see here, which looks um, a little bit anachronistic. You know, you see the uh, God Eternal Captain here. It's just a one of, so it's not the most important card in the deck. And I am thinking that with a lot of God Eternals, not all, there, there's some reasons to play more than one of some of these, but with a lot of these God Eternals, you don't necessarily need more than one copy. Uh, you don't ever really want to draw more than one, because it's just going to keep coming back anyway. So It's not necessary in a lot of cases. To play more than one, if you draw it, great. If the game goes long, you're more likely to draw it, and that's when Kepnit's good anyway. You know. So, But it looks uh, the treasure map looks anachronistic, because it is not you know, an instant or sorcery. Usually you want to play a, sh sh a buttload. <laughs> Almost slipped up there. You want to play a buttload of instants and sorceries and stuff in your deck. Um, this one doesn't so much, you know, it plays 17 total, which is still, uh, you know, kind of jacked. That's that's a fair amount. But, you know, Treasure Map looks like it should be maybe Charter Course or Opt or Chemister's Insight or something like that. But this obviously, like I said, works with um, Soul Diviner. And it's going to help you draw cards at instant speed once it does flip over. You know, once you get um, uh, Treasure Cove or whatever it's called, I always forget <laughs> <laughs> um, in any case, once you get that, uh, you can just sacrifice um, tokens on your opponent's turn, uh, treasure tokens, for card draw. And that'll help you, you know, proc Kefnet. So it actually does go well with Kefnet. And it's always a good two, you know, turn two play for these mid-range decks. So these are really spicy inclusion. And they went all the way to, you know, balls to the wall, four of treasure map. you got to commend them for that. So I like a lot of what this deck is doing. It's just so much spice. <laughs> you know, it's like Gleaming Overseer and Soul Diviner is four of. Liliana's in there with Kefnet, so you know it's going to be good. Treasure map out of nowhere. Dreadhorde Invasion is the key card. Like, there's just so many cool things going on with this deck, including the Wizard's Retort, by the way. Um, what you really, no one expects the Wizard's Retort <laughs> in a deck like this. It could just be a three-mana counterspell, which is not great, obviously, but it's fine uh, when you have to use it in that capacity. But obviously, Kefnet, um, not, actually not a wizard, I was thinking Soul Diviner. <laughs> Soul Diviner is a wizard, and uh, Gleaming Overseer is a wizard. So you do have eight wizards <laughs> in the deck to make sure the Wizard's Retort is, is basically a, a, a real counterspell for just two mana. So that's a cool little thing the deck does, too. There's just a lot of cool little things this deck is doing, and I respect that. Now, next to last deck here is Orzhov Aristocrats. Now, I obviously just talked about Aristocrats. We did a Mardu Aristocrats list the other day. Check that out if you haven't seen it. I actually really like that deck. But <laughs> I brought this deck up briefly at the beginning of that deck tech, uh, but I'm going to profile it again here just because, you know, I didn't really go very deep. <laughs> it was like a 30-second explanation of this deck. So I really like what this deck is trying to do, um, mostly the Aristocrats builds that I've been working with have been lower to the ground, really you know, fast if they possibly can be. Um, this one is a little bit more mid-range, but it still gets a bunch of one-drops. You know, It gets Gutter Bones and Hunted Witness in the one-drop slot. These are both obviously great Aristocrats creatures, and I shouldn't have to explain that too much. It gets the four of Midnight Reaper. Aristocrats has to have this. Um, but it also has the four priests, you know, this is the main sacrifice outlet for the deck. And you actually don't see too many sacrifice outlets in this deck. Aside from priests, we only get Plague Crafter, and that is more or less it. The deck kind of wants to just run its creatures into combat, and then punish the opponent for blocking with, you know, things like Cruel Celebrant, obviously, which is the feature new card for the deck, uh, kind of the thing that makes everything tick here. Uh, but, you know, we punish our opponent for blocking uh, by not only dealing damage to them, but by, you know, trading uh, some ways for value, like with Gutter Bones, you know, they, they, if they trade for Gutter Bones in combat, we can just get our Gutter Bones back. Hunted Witness, if they somehow trade or block that in combat, we get a creature back. Midnight Reaper, they block our guys in combat, we might draw cards. You know, Orzov Enforcer has uh, Afterlife and Death Touch, which is fantastic. Tithe Taker, Afterlife. So we're just trying to sort of punish them in combat, make combat a real problem. 
uh, for them <laughs> in this deck. And what really ties that theme together is Soren. You know, they have the blocker creatures, so they'll just die eventually. Uh, but if they do, not only can we get damage off of Cruel Celebrant, you know, card draw off of Reaper, all that stuff I was just talking about, but we're going to get life off of Soren, and that's just insane. Giving all your creatures lifelink is incredible in this deck, and some of the same tricks uh, that work in the Mardu Aristocrats deck work in this deck, namely uh, Midnight Reaper is the big one, uh, you know. Midnight Reaper with lifelink just negates any damage that it does do to you, so it goes really well with Soren. Um, as long as your creatures die on your turn, at least. So they die, uh, you know, in combat on your turn, you draw cards, you gain life, it's just insane. Um, plus this is a clock with lifelink, you know, note that he gives himself lifelink. So... It's a clock against slower decks if the game goes long, but mostly the business on this is this last ability, you know, the minus X. So it's just going to, you know, get back your cool celebrant, your gutter bones if you can't, you know, spectacle for whatever reason, although obviously he can plus two to spectacle, so just disregard that statement. But, you know, your Midnight Reaper, if they killed that, uh, Priest of Forgotten Gods. Like, one of the things I was talking about in the Mardu deck that rings true in every Aristocrats deck is that Aristocrats is almost like an aggressive combo deck that has to have like multiple pieces out at the same time to really get things going. And nowadays in Standard Magic, it's really tough to guarantee that you're going to have like three creatures out, um, three specific creatures out or whatever. So, you know, if you want to assemble the board of Cruel Celebrant plus, plus Forgotten Gods plus Midnight Reaper... Um, you can't just like play them all on curve and be like, oh, look, I did it. You know, like one of them's going to die or whatever. So being able to get these back and like truly assemble the board that you need to assemble to really pull off like aristocrats wins is really, really valuable. So Soren is just a perfect card for this deck, even though it looks kind of wonky when you first see it. Aside from that, we've also got Revival to keep up that theme. You know, we've got to keep our most important creatures on the board if we're really going to win the way we want to in this deck. So Revival is incredibly important. And I would imagine that sometimes we'll even cast the Revenge half against like control. But the last deck I want to look at today is probably the one that I'm most interested in, although I do have some issues with it, but we'll talk about it, um, is Bant Vivian. Uh, this deck has appeared not only um, in my Deck Doctor inbox, <laughs> along with a bunch of other Vivian decks. Everyone wants to make uh, Vivian Champion of the Wilds work, and you can make it work in multiple lists. You know, I've gotten an Abzan list in my inbox uh, just a couple of days ago, working on it, by the way. Um, but I've also gotten a Bant Vivian list in my inbox, and I've seen people on um, the Spikes Reddit talking about the Bant Vivian list. And there are some really good things <laughs> to like about this list. Obviously, Vivian just makes you prioritize playing creatures. You almost, you know, almost entirely want to play creatures in your deck apart from Vivian. Uh, because of both of her abilities, you know, creature spells have flash. That's pretty decent for only three mana, but the minus two, uh, you want to hit on that every single time. And know the way this is worded. Even if Vivian dies, you get to keep... You know, you can play the creature, <laughs> you know, from, from Exile, even if Vivian's dead. So that's just awesome, too. And this deck has the ability to do some really crazy, cheesy stuff. You know, like Deputy of Detention is probably one of the better reasons to go Bant in the first place. Although, this is where I have an issue with the deck. Now, obviously, Bant, Deputy of Detention is great to play at instant speed, but you're just kind of like going around your elbow to get to your thumb there because you just it's, it's just like a, a Law Mage's Binding on a body, and Law Mage's Binding doesn't seem much play. Now, the body helps. Uh, don't get me wrong, but it's a lot more removable than Law Mage's Binding. <laughs> it's just, so um, I guess it has a wider spread of targets, too. I mean, it's not entirely Law Mage's Binding, but it's still kind of what it's going to play like 90% of the time. You know, Law Mage's Binding with a 1-3 body, which is better than Law Mage's Binding, I guess. But why make this deck ban when you can make this deck Soul Tie and just play Hostage Taker in this spot? That's what I don't understand. Um, there's probably a reason for that, but I've been making this deck... And even though I've, I've seen a lot of people, again, you know, want to do Abzan or Bant, the deck that I've been working on is Sultai, uh, and it doesn't do just the Wild Growth Walker package, even though that package is, you know, obviously very good. I think that it's just kind of the, the standard, like, rote, typical package. It's a little boring at this point. It's going to rotate out in a few months, so I want to try out some uh, different stuff we can do with the early game Sultai package, aside from just Explore. And I think that deck has a lot of options, like Grove Chamber Guardian, for instance. But I just think Hostage Taker is probably way better than Card Lake Deputy. You know, you play Hostage Taker either on their combat step or at the end of your turn, and you untap and immediately play the thing that you, you know, took hostage. So I think that that's a really cool interaction. But obviously Deputy serves much the similar purpose there. And it's got a wider spread of options in Hostage Taker at a lower mana cost for what that's worth. And it's worth kind of a lot in a format with a bunch of Planeswalkers. So, you know, you can talk yourself into Deputy. I think it's still a great card. Thrilled Mystic is already instant speed, but it is cool that Vivian can help you kind of dig for counterspells. 
in a way. And the ability to, you know, play the um, the creatures that you got off of Vivian's minus two, even if she's dead, is also really cool with Frilled Mystic. You know, I picked up a Frilled Mystic on turn three, um, and then on turn five, my Vivian died. But that's that's finally, that's cool. You know, I basically got an, 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 an extra counter spell in my hand, sort of. So I like that, in a way, Vivian's digging for counter spells by finding you Frilled Mystic. I like that. Got Eternal Oketra. Now, this is a god that you could play multiple copies of, and they have here. Three, you know. The, playing this at instant speed is just unbelievable, um, especially considering that you can then play other creatures at instant speed and get 4-4 four, four zombies, you know, during your opponent's combat step. <laughs> it's just, just a huge headache. <laughs> you know, once you do have this down at instant speed, it can block immediately, you know, during your opponent's combat step. And then if it stays in play, which it very likely will, um, once it rolls around to your opponent's next turn, then they just have to worry about, like, an Oketra in play, a Vivian, and all your untapped sources, you know? Because at that point, they just really cannot reliably attack into you. You know, not only do you have a big god on the battlefield that effectively has six power and six toughness, um, but they have to worry about you, you know, flashing a creature into block and getting another 4-4 four, four to block. They just can never profitably attack against you in that situation. And as you, you know, fill the board with 4-4s, four you just win. You untap and win. So, got to turn a Oketra is just insane. And I don't mind playing extra copies either because you can always, if you have a Oketra out, you just play another Oketra and get your 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> you know, the Oketra that was already on the battlefield dies to Legend Rule or whatever. One of them does, anyway. Um, and it just goes three cards deep, and then a few turns later you get another free 4-4, basically. So, playing these in multiples isn't so bad. Um, the deck also gets Grow Chamber Guardian. Another cool play here is that you can you, know, you can just go Grow Chamber on two and then Vivian on three, but if you really want to have fun and do a cool spicy play, you can always play your Vivian, and then when you have enough mana, play Grow Chamber at the end of their turn or something and immediately adapt it which is a really, really sweet play, so it gives you that, but the best play in the deck is Hydroid Crisis. This is already one of the best cards in Standard. As the format trends more mid-range, we'll probably see even more Crisis-y's, Crisis -i? Um, and being able to play it at instant speed is just broken, you know? This basically gives you just this, like, Sphinx's Revelation on a body, um finally at instant speed, which is just disheartening. <laughs> you know, it's probably one of the more busted plays in all of Standard right now. And it's another reason why I want to build the deck Soul Tie. You know, we still get this in the Soul Tie package, so I just don't know why you wouldn't do that. But still, <laughs> you know, I droid Crisis at instant speed. It's probably one of the best things that you can do in the entire format. So it doesn't surprise me this deck went 5-0, and we've seen multiple iterations of it at this point. Aside from that, there's some, you know, Mana Ramp. see Lana Relves in here. Incubation Druid and stuff, you know, we're playing a lot of stuff. Relatively high up on the curve. And in the case of, like, Lana Relves, it's always nice to drop Elves turn 1, Vivian turn 2, start going to town. So, there's a lot of reasons why you might want Ramp in the deck. You know, you get Oketra a little bit faster. You get to, you know, adapt Grove Chamber faster. Frilled Mestic on turn 3 sometimes. So there's lots of reasons why you might need this Ramp. And Knight of Autumn is in there. This is tricky, too. You know, being able to play Knight of Autumn at instant speed fantastic. Just, just <laughs> absolutely wonderful to be able to play this at instant speed. And just, you know, get a body and gain the four life at the end of their turn or during the combat step. Put a 4-3 into play to block or whatever. You know, destroy their search for his concept before it flips. There's a lot about this card, you know. Knight of Autumn and Instant Speed also allows you to, like, let's say they play Wilderness Reclamation and tap out for it on turn four. Well, if you've got turn three Vivian, then you get to immediately, you know, flash in Knight of Autumn and kill their Wilderness Reclamation, so a lot to like about this card, too, in this deck, obviously. It's just a one-of in the main deck, but that's cool. It's totally fine. <laughs> you know, I can see just relegating this entirely to the board, but in the standard, there's a lot of reasons why you might want Knight of Autumn. Helps you win the race against aggro, kills a bunch of problematic enchantments and stuff, so I can see why the one of snuck in, but there's a bunch of other, like, really spicy one ofs in here. You know, there's Merfolk Skydiver, which almost certainly gets cut, Probably, you know, this goes pretty well with the Incubation Druid and some other stuff in the deck. Um, and Proliferate works really nicely with our Planeswalkers, our Grow Chamber Guardians and such. But I'm just not 100% sure <laughs> this ends up, you know, making the cut entirely. It is a great late game piece. But in the end, I'm just, I don't know, guys. I think that it's a little, a little too spicy for its own good. But the deck does need to fill out its two-drop slot a little bit. There's probably better ways to do it than this, but it needs creatures, too, to play with Vivian. This is fine to play at instant speed. You know, you get a counter on something at instant speed. You get a, a, a flash blocker uh, that flies. You know, proliferate at instant speed if you have seven mana. There's some cool stuff to do. 
Um, but I'm just again, I'm not sure that even with all of that play on the card, that it really it really ends up making the cut in the end. But there's also the Silver Bullet Shalai, which I think could be a two of. All things considered, it's just a great card for the deck. One of the other best reasons to go white, you know, if you're going to play white instead of um, black in this deck. Shalai, again, is just probably why, you know? Like, the Anthem effect on this is actually really, really relevant, especially with some of the um, the adapt creatures in the deck, like Druid and Grove Chamber Guardian. Shalai goes really well. Uh, but this just helps you go bigger than your opponents in the late game. A lot of late game action nowadays. So you got to find a good late game plan. Shalai is good for that, but obviously also the protection is mostly why we're playing the card. You know, this can crossways protect Vivian, you know. So Vivian into instant speed Shalai seems like a pretty good play, especially if they target your Vivian with the Brassus Contempt or something. You just flash in Shalai and fizzle the Frasca's Contempt. So that's... That seems like a great play, too. Anyway, the deck also plays Rolesque. Let's talk, I touched on that just a second ago. I'm a little surprised to see this card, but not really, you know. Um, I've sort of talked this card up a lot. It was on my sleepers list. I wanted it to be really good, and I'm glad that it makes the cut in this deck, but I'm not sure that it does in week two. You know what I mean? Um, really, really impactful five drop, though. And the deck is looking for good five drops, but, you know, it already plays the Oketros. And I'm not sure that it wants two more legendary <laughs> five drops at the top of its curve. So we'll have to wait and see um, what this deck looks like. This is definitely the spiciest version of a Vivian deck that, I'm, that I could possibly show you. Uh, it's the only one running Roalesque. And I'm not sure next week that it's still going to be doing so, but this really it is really impactful. It's got great stats, especially for what mana cost you're putting into it. The trample is actually much, much better than it looks on this card. You just kind of tend to skim past the trample, but the tra trample is insanely relevant on this. Um, and the ability to, you know, immediately adapt, well, effectively, adapt a, a Incubation Druid or Grow Chamber Guardian, like go get another Crab Person, or, you know, immediately tap Incubation Druid for three mana after you play Roalesque. Those are both really, really good plays, but it also just makes, you know, Frilled Mystics and Deputy Detentions bigger, you know, and that's that's always good. Puts, like, Deputy Detention out of Lightning Strike range, good thing to be able to do right now. You know, Proliferate, Proliferate again is just going to really protect your Vivians when Roalesque dies. It's going to get your Ajanis to, um... And they'll get you even more value. And I'll say that, too, about Ajani. I haven't even pointed this card out yet. Um, another reason to play white in the deck. You know, Creatures Having Vigilance is a little bit better than it looks in this format, too. Um, and this is just going to be a great play against any aggro deck that you run across. You know, Gains of the Incremental Life allows you to tack in against them, consequence-free for the most part. And it allows you to just, like, anthem all of your creatures at least a couple of turns and protect your Vivian, too, a little bit more by putting more, you know, loyalty on it, allowing it to minus two more often. There's just so much that Greathearted does in this deck. I'm surprised it's just the one of, but it's really only effective in a very specific matchup. But that said, you know, it's not just good against aggro, I guess. Like, against Sultai, games that go long, I could see this minus two being, like, very, very relevant in those matchups. They're just, like, going bigger than other decks. So, you know, a deck with 31 creatures, obviously, <laughs> this minus two is going to be really desirable. And you can usually do it up to three times, especially if you can protect him well, which isn't hard to do in a deck with this many creatures. Aside from that, there's one Settle the Wreckage, which, like, looks kind of wonky, but I imagine that this just wins you the game, like, 50% of the time when you play it, or more. Honestly, if your opponent does, you know, think that they're able to swing in on you, and get advantage off of you somehow. You know, there's so many ways to make it really hard for your opponent to attack into you in this deck. But if they do think they have the upper hand, you just settle them and then swing the next turn and just win, you know. Or if you're a little slow to the board, you know, which is not hard to imagine. This deck doesn't play too many two drops. Vivian is a must play on turn three. Um, if the deck, you know, wants to work the way it wants to. Plus, it's got big stuff like God Eternal Ketra and Roalesque, so... I can see slow starts being a thing in this deck. Settle is going to help, you know, solve some of those problems for you if you draw in the early game, so... Just sort of keep aggro from just murdering you before you can really get set up, so... There's a lot that I like about what this deck is doing. Again, this is the spiciest version of a Vivian deck I could have brought you, but there were at least, like, three Vivian decks to point out. Um, over this last week. Um, that is all for this one. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming soon. You know, more deck techs. Got a couple of other interesting, you know, little non-deck techy videos I want to kick out before too long. Uh, but I did hope, I do hope you guys enjoyed this sort of new format, testing out this uh, screen recorder. I really hope that this works.
<laughs> and I'm sorry about the long video today, but we really got into it and discussed um, a lot of what's sort of going on in the early going of the format. Again, it doesn't paint the entire picture, and there are still some of the same decks that we saw last season. But even those have evolved some, and I do like sort of what standard is trending towards, and I think there's a lot of, you know, room for improvement and room for brewing in the format to um, to go, you know, pl plenty. Sanders is far from solved, obviously, in week zero. So, you know, I'm just really excited to see where we go from here in the next, you know, couple of months here. So, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit the like button. I know we're almost, we're like 50 minutes in <laughs> at this point, so it's a little too late for the call to action. But if you're still there, hit the like button if you enjoyed the content. Um, consider subscribing if you haven't done it yet. Hit the bell for notifications. If you really like what I do around here, join the Patreon. Um, it's just a dollar a month to vote on what decks and videos and stuff that we do next. I'll let you know what we're doing 24 hours in advance. I'm worth a dollar a month to do it. If you want to check out any of these decks, go over to tcgplayer.com. Link in the description for that. It's the cheapest place you're going to get any of these decks. Uh, and they do sponsor your con my content, so full disclosure on that. But they, they really are, truthfully, the cheapest place you're going to get these decks. So <laughs> check out the link in the description for that. And I am pretty sure that is it for now. So I will see you guys back on camera, fresh and new and pretty. Um, Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon, and I am done. Yeah, I feel like I just want to talk all forever. Like this is a podcast. <laughs> in, any, in any case, I think I'm done. So I will catch you cats later. I've been Deb from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind. <laughs>